Thank you very much for coming back for part two of We Now Control Weather, Extreme Heat Events, Dirty Weather, Climate Disasters. A few quick notes. This video will likely raise a number of questions. Unfortunately, I can't address them all in the video, but I do have a couple of solutions for you and I'll explain at the end of the video. The video moves fast. I've tried to compress four years of research into less than 25 minutes, so feel free to stop it at any time to inspect the graph. The sea surface temperature data presented in this video is available to the public in easy to use formats, so you could check my results if you like. Last, this is basically a technical presentation, but what I've tried to do is make it easy to understand. In the first video, we illustrated how claims of climate disasters by Kevin Trenberth were based on the warming of sea surface temperatures in climate models not based on measured sea surface temperatures. That is, we discussed the 2012 peer-reviewed paper by Trenberth and Fasulo, which included a number of statements similar to the following. From the abstract, natural variability, especially ENSO, and that stands for El Nino Southern Oscillation, and global warming from human influences together resulted in very high sea surface temperatures in several places that played a vital role in subsequent developments. We showed how a sea surface temperature subset of the global oceans made up primarily of the Indian and Pacific Oceans contained the four regions upon which Trenberth and Fasulo had based their analyses of extreme weather events. We then showed that the climate model simulated a continuous warming of more than three-tenths of a degree Celsius, and that's more than half a degree Fahrenheit, over the past 20 years for the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Last, we concluded that Trenberth and Fasulo's understanding of the continuous warming of sea surface temperatures had to have been based on climate models not measured sea surface temperatures because the sea surface temperatures for the Indian and Pacific Oceans have not warmed in 20 years. And that's based on Hadley Center's interpolated sea surface temperature data set, which is the data set used by Trenberth and Fasulo. In this video, we'll extend the time period to the past 30 years, and we'll show how and why we know the warming of global sea surface temperatures over that period was natural. The first thing we're going to do is switch sea surface temperature data sets. There are two satellite-based sea surface temperature data sets. And the reason we're using satellite-based data is because they are more spatially complete than data sets that rely only on buoys and ship inlet measurements for temperature readings. Trenberth and Fasulo used the Hadley Center's interpolated sea surface temperature data set. It also extends back in time before the satellite era, so it's a good data set for a long-term study. The second satellite era data set is one from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, otherwise known as NOAA, and it's the Reynolds Optimum Interpolation Sea Surface Temperature Data Set Version 2, which I'm going to use. It's best for short-term studies of 30 years. Satellite-based sea surface temperature data sets need to be adjusted for satellite biases. The Reynolds OI.V2 data set has better satellite bias adjustments. As you can see in this graph, it shows more warming over the past 30 years. In effect, I'm putting myself at a disadvantage by using the Reynolds sea surface temperature data. If we look at a graph of sea surface temperature anomalies for the past 30 years, we can see two very obvious things. First, global sea surface temperatures have warmed. We can ask Excel to add a linear trend line, and we can see that they warmed about a quarter of a degree Celsius, or 45 hundredths of a degree Fahrenheit, over those 30 years. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, says that only greenhouse gases could have caused that warming, but they base their beliefs on climate models, not on data. In their fourth assessment report, they wrote, Figure 9.5 shows that simulations that incorporate anthropogenic forcings, including increasing greenhouse gas concentrations and the effects of aerosols, and that also incorporate natural external forcings, 
provide a consistent explanation of the observed temperature record, whereas simulations that include only natural forcings do not simulate the warming observed over the last three decades. That's why we're going to look at the sea surface temperature data for the most recent three decades and show that the warming occurred naturally. Of course, climate models overestimate the warming by about 74% for the past 30 years. Second, we can see that the warming was not continuous. There were large swings in global sea surface temperatures as they warmed. The upward spikes are caused by El Nino events, and most of the dips are caused by La Nina events. There were also two dips, or temporary coolings, that are caused by volcanic eruptions, though one is hard to see because it occurred at the same time as a very strong El Nino. Given the oceans cover about 70% of the surface of the Earth, given the vast majority of global warming is in response to the warming of the global oceans. Then, the hypothesis of greenhouse gas dominated man-made global warming has one fundamental requirement. Greenhouse gases must warm the surface and subsurface temperatures of the global oceans. To contradict the hypothesis, there is no evidence whatsoever that anthropogenic greenhouse gases played any role in the warming of global sea surface temperatures over the past 30 years. That is, natural processes can explain all of the warming. We simply need to divide the global oceans into two subsets to illustrate this fact. The East Pacific, and for the sake of simplicity, we'll call the other data set the rest of the world. First, another given. El Nino and La Nina are natural processes. That is, the warm water released by an El Nino is created naturally. There is nothing to indicate otherwise in the sea surface temperature data since 1900 or in the ocean heat content record since 1955. We'll discuss this further in part three of the video. The East Pacific sea surface temperature anomalies are compared to scaled Nino 3.4 region data in this graph. Now you're wondering, what are Nino 3.4 temperatures? The Nino 3.4 region is an area of the eastern equatorial Pacific that is directly impacted by El Nino and La Nina events. The sea surface temperatures for the Nino 3.4 region are a commonly used reference for the timing, strength, and duration of El Nino and La Nina events. As we can see in this graph of Nino 3.4 sea surface temperature anomalies, the sea surface temperatures make very large swings there in responses to El Nino and La Nina events. Also notice how the sea surface temperatures there have not warmed in 30 years. That's also true since the start of the 20th century. There is no long-term warming of the sea surface temperatures of the Nino 3.4 region. The global oceans simply warm around the eastern equatorial Pacific. One might think climate modelers might want to consider that. Of course, the climate models get that wrong too. Back to the East Pacific data for the past 30 years. The Nino 3.4 data in the graph has been reduced in scale so that it better aligns with the East Pacific data. The East Pacific mimics the Nino 3.4 data. Notice the trend line of the East Pacific data. It's flat. Can't get much flatter than that. A linear trend of seven thousandths of a degree Celsius per decade indicates there is no evidence that body of water has warmed in 30 years. The East Pacific covers about 33 percent of the surface area of the global oceans and it has not responded by warming to increasing carbon dioxide emissions. Think about that for a moment. It's tough for climate scientists to explain. How do I know? They haven't explained it. Climate models say if the East Pacific Ocean was warmed by greenhouse gases, the sea surface temperatures there 
would have, should have warmed more than four tenths of a degree Celsius over those three decades. Yet they haven't warmed. But they do warm in response to El Nino events and they do cool during La Nina events. Here's a quick explanation of why the sea surface temperatures of the East Pacific warm and cool in response to the evolution and decay of El Nino events. And no, I'm not neglecting La Nina events. They're simply an exaggerated enzo-neutral or normal state of the tropical Pacific. The El Nino state is the abnormal phase. Before an El Nino, most of the warm water that will fuel the El Nino is below the surface of the western tropical Pacific. Because it's below the surface, it's not included in the surface temperature record. During the evolution of the El Nino, much of the warm water sloshes east and spreads across the surface of the eastern tropical Pacific. During the decay of the El Nino, the warm water sloshes back to the west out of the East Pacific. Since the East Pacific is only the temporary residence of the warm water from El Nino events, if anthropogenic greenhouse gases were to make their presence easily known on a body of water, it would be the East Pacific. There's really nothing else to influence it, yet it hasn't warmed. Let's move on to the sea surface temperature data for the rest of the world. It covers about 67% of the global oceans. It obviously has to have warmed over the past 30 years since the global data has warmed. First, let's discuss the hypothesis of anthropogenic global warming. Hypothesis is just a fancy word for assumption or supposition or guess. An educated guess, mind you. Anthropogenic global warming is not a proven fact. It's just an assumption. In theory, it works on land. In reality, it does not work for the oceans. We've already seen that for the East Pacific data. And for the rest of the world, that will become plain as day as we go on. Given the anthropogenic global warming hypothesis assumes there are three components to the warming of global sea surface temperatures. First, a man-made warming signal. Example, in their concluding discussion, Trenberth and Fasulo write, the human influence is systematic and persistent and can be thought of as the underlying warming of about six tenths of a degree Celsius since the 1950s, while there are large regional and temporal fluctuations superposed on this warming by natural variability. Well now, for the East Pacific, we've seen those large regional and temporal fluctuations and they're caused by El Nino and La Nina events, but there was no warming for the past 30 years there. The second component is the volcanic aerosol signal to explain the temporary coolings caused by catastrophic volcanic eruptions. The data set here is aerosol optical depth, and I've added a trend to it so that it, I could overlay it on the assumed anthropogenic global warming signal. And the third component is an El Nino and La Nina event signal to explain the additional variations. I've added a trend to the scaled Nino 3.4 data in this case to make the relationship easier to see. The assumption here is that El Nino events cause the global oceans to warm and that La Nina events cause them to cool proportionally. We've seen that with the East Pacific data but it is not true for the rest of the world. And that brings us to a myth about La Nina. It was created by anthropogenic global warming proponents, scientists and bloggers, to neutralize the effects of El Ninos and La Ninas. We know global sea surface temperature anomalies warm in response to an El Nino event. Now here's the myth. Global surface temperatures cool proportionally during La Nina events. As shown earlier, the East Pacific and Nino 3.4 sea surface temperature data do cool during La Nina, but for the rest of the world they do not cool during all La Ninas. We simply have to detrend the rest of the world's sea surface temperature data and compare that to scaled Nino 3.4 data, our ENSO index, 
in order to show it. As expected, the rest of the world's sea surface temperatures temporarily cool in response to volcanic eruptions. These divergences are highlighted in green. We can use aerosol optical depth data to confirm the timing of the volcanic eruptions to show those divergences were caused by them. We can also see that the rest of the world data warms during El Nino events. However, contrary to the fairy tale created by man-made global warming proponents, the rest of the world's sea surface temperature data do not cool proportionally in response to the La Nina events that followed the very strong El Nino events of 1986, 87, 88, that was a multi-year one, and the great big one in 1997, 98. Those divergences are highlighted in brown. Why don't they cool during La Ninas that follow those major El Ninos? Recall our earlier explanation of the warming and cooling of the East Pacific. Before an El Nino, most of the warm water that will fuel the El Nino is below the surface of the western tropical Pacific. It's created naturally during La Nina events that came before the El Nino. During the evolution of the El Nino, much of the warm water sloshes east and spreads across the surface of the eastern tropical Pacific. Before the El Nino, much of the warm water was below the surface, now it's on the surface. During the decay of the El Nino, the warm water sloshes back to the west out of the East Pacific. That's why the East Pacific hasn't warmed in the past 30 years. It's only the temporary home for the warm water. Now we have to stop and consider something. Where'd the warm water go that was left over from the El Nino? The last time we saw it, it had sloshed out of the East Pacific. Obviously, it's now in a portion of the region we're calling the rest of the world. It was below the surface before the El Nino, but it is on the surface after the El Nino. That leftover warm water, it also counteracts the effects of the La Nina on the other ocean basins, most noticeably in the North Atlantic. We just looked at the rest of the world data that has been detrended. Let's look at it with its trend intact. That way we can see the effects of the leftover warm water. The rest of the world sea surface temperatures warm in response to the major El Ninos, but they do not cool in response to the La Nina events that trail them. As a result, the sea surface temperatures there acquire a long-term warming trend caused by those El Nino and La Nina events. Also notice how the rest of the world data does not warm between the major El Nino events. That indicates the El Nino events are responsible for all of the warming of the rest of the world data for the past 30 years. Let's clarify something. And we can do that by removing the North Atlantic from the rest of the world data. We're doing that because the North Atlantic has another mode of natural variability called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. The South Atlantic, Indian, West Pacific region covers about 53% of the surface area of the global oceans. The sea surface temperature anomalies for the South Atlantic, Indian, and West Pacific region show the same upward shifts for the same reasons. But they cool between the major El Nino events. Given the South Atlantic, Indian, West Pacific region has a long-term warming trend, given it cools between the major El Ninos, given it warms only in response to the major El Ninos, and given El Ninos are fueled naturally, then the long-term warming trend in the South Atlantic Indian West Pacific region is caused only by the naturally occurring major El Nino events. That's only logical. Go ahead, back up the video for a minute or so and run through that logic again. Summary. The East Pacific represents 33% of the surface area of the global oceans. Sea surface temperatures there have not warmed in 30 years. The long-term warming of the sea surface temperatures for the South Atlantic, Indian, West Pacific region is caused 
only by the naturally occurring major El Nino events. That region covers 53% of the global oceans. The North Atlantic has another mode of natural variability which caused it to warm at a faster rate than the natural warming of the other ocean basins and it covers the last 14 percent of the global oceans. The sea surface temperature records show over the last 30 years the warming of global sea surface temperatures occurred naturally. This topic has been discussed in numerous posts at my blog. Starting in January 2009 many of them were cross-posted at What's Up With That, which is the world's most viewed blog on global warming and climate change. Of course, a skeptical website garnering the most web traffic doesn't sit well with proponents of man-made global warming. The title of one of my recent blog posts asks the question, The warming of global oceans are man-made greenhouse gases important or impotent? They are impotent. They are a land-only forcing. They are an also-ran, a second or third tier climate forcing. Anthropogenic greenhouse gases only impact the warming of land surface air temperatures, but they do it on top of the massive contribution to land air surface temperatures of the natural warming of the global oceans. And man-made greenhouse gases impact land surface air temperatures along with other factors and forcings. These include land use changes, the impacts of poorly sited surface stations, urban heat island effect, black carbon on snow, overly aggressive modifications to land surface air temperature records, etc. As noted earlier, this video probably generated a lot of questions. You can ask them at my blog if you like, I'll be happy to answer them there. Or you can buy a book. I've answered questions I've received over the past three and a half years in great detail in that book. The description of this YouTube video includes a link to the blog post Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About El Nino and La Nina. It provides an in-depth overview of who turned on the heat the unsuspected global warming culprit El Nino Southern Oscillation. Answers to questions you may have and replies to arguments some people have tried about the content of this video are included in my new book. Many of the arguments are simply additional myths created by proponents of anthropogenic global warming. They are failed attempts to explain away the blatantly obvious long-term effects of the big El Nino and La Nina events that we just saw and discussed. If you have a new understanding of why global surface temperatures warmed over the past 30 years, let your friends know about this video. That's the only way we're going to get word out. In part 3, we'll discuss and illustrate how the instrument temperature record indicates that El Nino events are fueled naturally. And I'll answer the questions this video generated. Researchers who are skeptical of anthropogenic global warming like me, are not funded by big oil, no matter what you've heard. So tips are very much appreciated. You all have a nice day.